Hey guys, so this semester I decided to take Dr. Lawrence's Theories of Personality class and at the start of the semester Dr. Lawrence was actually um, going to have me give the personality lecture during class time but of course that's no longer possible given the circumstances so we decided that we could make a little extra credit assignment out of this instead. So make sure that you have the assignment page pulled up because you'll want to fill it out as you're watching the video. And if you've been doing my virtual SI sessions, you'll realize that this is a lot like what I have you do for attendance credit, except this worksheet is shorter and it's less detailed than one of my section work or one of my session worksheets. Um, the answers to the worksheet questions are things I'm going to say, not things that are written down on the PowerPoint slides. So this is really our way of confirming that you did the entire assignment, which of course includes watching this video while you fill out the sheet. So make sure you complete that as you go, and we're gonna learn some really cool, interesting, and also very strange psychological theories today. So we'll start out talking about what is personality to begin with, and this is the definition that comes from uh, my Theories of Personality textbook. So in that textbook, it's defined as the set of psychological traits and mechanisms within the individual that are organized and relatively enduring and that influence his or her interactions with and adaptations to the environment. Wow, that's a lot, right? So let's look at kind of the key parts of this. Um, the first one is within the individual. So when we did chapter 13 on social psychology, we were looking at group interactions. But when we talk about personality, we're talking about traits within the individual person. So this is on an individual level, not on a group level. And then the next important key part is relatively enduring. So this really just speaks to the fact that personality traits stay pretty constant over time once they're developed. And a word that you'll see really frequently as it pertains to personality traits is the word characteristic. And when something is characteristic of a person, it's consistently defining of that person. So are you generally easygoing and relaxed or are you tense and controlling, right? These would be characteristic measures of your disposition. And then the definition that your textbook gives you is much simpler. Personality is just an individual's characteristic, there it is again, pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting. Okay, so first we're gonna start off by talking about psychodynamic theories. And the first thing you wanna understand is the difference between psychodynamic and psychoanalytic or psychoanalysis theories. So um, psychoanalytic theory was developed first and it was developed by Freud. So psychoanalytic theory is going to reflect the views of Freud, whereas psychodynamic theory, which came after, sort of takes these views of Freud and modifies them and sort of streamlines them into something more um, scientifically valid instead of just totally interpretive, right? So psychoanalytic theory reflects the views of Freud, whereas psychodynamic theory reflects the views of Freud as well as the views of some of his followers. And then you also wanna know that psychodynamic theory is still practiced sometimes, but psychoanalytic theory is almost obsolete at this point. It is rarely ever practiced now. And so here's a little Venn diagram to show you the differences, the key differences between psychoanalytic and psychodynamic theories. So first, psychoanalytic was developed by Freud, whereas psychodynamic branched off from Freud's psychoanalytic theory and became something new. And something that, like I said, is more widely practiced now. So psychoanalytic is going to include some things that psychodynamic doesn't, such as id, ego, superego, psychosexual stages, and defense mechanisms. These are all really closely associated with Freud. He developed the theory on all of those things. But these are things that we don't really have a lot of good verification or evidence for, and so it's not something that we use within the psychodynamic perspective, so that gets left out. In psychoanalytic, we use free association as the main technique, but for psychodynamic, they use projective tests as the main technique. We'll talk about what each of those are in a little bit. And then this is a pretty important difference too. In psychoanalytic theory, the unconscious is viewed really negatively as a storehouse of unacceptable or inappropriate thoughts and feelings. Whereas in psychodynamic theory, we're gonna view the unconscious way more neutrally. It's just the place where information processing occurs that's below our level of awareness. And then this last point, um, psychoanalytic therapy was a very long and time consuming therapy process. And this is kind of where the genius of Freud really shows through because Freud kept his clients coming back by convincing them that the therapy process is long and arduous to make process or to make progress. 
Um, but the moment that you want to check out and leave, he's going to claim that you're experiencing resistance and you're about to make a breakthrough. And so we'll come back to that later on when we discuss some issues with Freud's practices and beliefs. But what really holds both of these together is that they emphasize the importance of the unconscious and of childhood experiences on the development of personality. Okay. So next is Freud's personality structure of the id, ego, and superego. And so the id is going to be that unconscious psychic energy that strives to satisfy your sexual and aggressive drives. So id actually stands for internal desire. And so what you're talking about with the id is anything that brings you um, pleasure, really. Gratification and pleasure is what's associated with the id. So the id is impulsive. We don't care about the consequences. We just want what we want. It's interested in fulfilling the wants and desires of the individual. And the id is fully unconscious, according to Freud. We are not aware um, of, of those desires, really. And then the ego has to do with the reality principle. So the ego sort of weighs costs and benefits and figures out how to realistically bring pleasure um, to the person rather than pain. So the ego is logical and methodical. It's interested in costs and benefits and ultimate outcomes. And this is partially conscious and partially unconscious. So if the id wants um, to steal something, right? We wanna steal that Xbox game that your mom won't buy for you, right? Your ego is the one that's gonna come in and you know weigh the costs and benefits of this and say, how likely is it that I'm gonna get caught doing this? And if it's likely that I'm gonna get caught, I shouldn't do it because that'll lead to a consequence rather than the pleasure of getting that game, right? And then the super ego is essentially your conscience or your sense of morality. So in that same example, um, if you're thinking about stealing that Xbox game, your ego comes in and says, can we get away with it? Are we actually going to find pleasure from this or are we going to face consequences? But your super ego is going to come in and say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't even matter. We're concerned with whether it's right or wrong and stealing is wrong, so you shouldn't do it, right? And so these really kind of interact with one another and they also influence our personality pretty greatly, um, according to Freud, of course. <laughs> so if we ignore the id, then we're gonna feel dissatisfied and we could react with something like anger or depression, right? But if the id is always responded to and always satisfied, then that's going to make us selfish, impatient, impulsive, reckless, right? Things like that. Um, similarly, if the ego is ignored, we can definitely get ourselves into trouble, right? Because we're not thinking about the consequences of our actions. But if the ego is always satisfied, we may do things that are wrong, but we won't necessarily get in trouble for it, right? And then if the ego gives in to the id, so we, um, we respond to the id and we give it what it wants, then the super ego interacts with that by coming in and making you feel guilty for what you've done. So that's kind of how they all um, affect your personality and interact with each other. When it comes to the superego, if you have an underdeveloped superego, you don't feel guilt. But if you have an overdeveloped superego, you might be judgmental of others and close-minded, something like that. And then here's just a little illustration from the textbook that shows um, sort of how much of these are conscious versus unconscious in Freud's idea, theory. And so he says the id is fully unconscious, anything underwater is unconscious and out of the water is conscious in this illustration. So he says the id is totally unconscious, the superego and the ego though are partially conscious, partially unconscious. Okay, the psychosexual stages. <laughs> this is one of the more difficult parts of Freud's theory to understand, but it's also one of the most interesting. So Freud says that we have different stages of, stages of development during which um, our pleasure-seeking energy is focused on a certain pleasure-sensitive area of the body, and we call those areas erogenous zones. So let's start out with the oral stage. So there's a crisis that's associated with each of these stages, and the crisis of the oral stage is that you've got to wean yourself off of breastfeeding or you're not really in control of anything at this age, so your parents have to wean you off of breastfeeding. And so the idea is this, breastfeeding is like the ultimate oral pleasure for a child of this age. And the task of weaning a child from breastfeeding can be really difficult for a kid to deal with. So Freud says that the way that the parent handles dealing with that crisis has a huge impact on the child's development. 
So if the kid is weaned properly, then the child should exhibit positive personality traits. But if they're not weaned properly, then they're gonna develop a fixation in that stage and develop some bad personality traits as a result of that. We'll come back to this and talk about fixations in just a moment. During the anal stage, um, the pleasure centers on the bladder and your bowel movements. The crisis at this age is to potty train, but more accurately, the crisis is dealing with external controls. That's one of the answers on your um, worksheet, so make sure to write that down. The crisis really deals with external controls. So here's how that works. Prior to being potty trained, kids wear diapers, right? So they can go to the bathroom anytime they want. So Freud says <laughs> that when potty training happens, children are stripped of this freedom and now there are these external controls like pressure and rules from the parents that dictate not just when you can go to the bathroom, but where you can go to the bathroom too. And so children react pretty poorly to this. And we'll come back when we talk about personality traits on the next slide to how that sort of affects your development. But um, just understand that it's, it's the issue of external controls, the issue of parents or other adults telling you what you can or can't do, um, even with something as natural as, you know, bladder or bowel movement. Then within the phallic stage, the pleasure is centered on the genital area. And then um, the crisis is castration anxiety. So we'll, we'll talk about that and how that makes some sense. So really it all kind of comes down to this Oedipus Electra complex. The Oedipus complex is what we call it for boys. The Electra complex is what we call it for girls, but they kind of, they're, they're a lot alike, but I'll pick out those differences for you. So um, the Oedipus complex refers to a boy's sexual attraction to his mother at this age. So Freud says the boy feels jealous of his father and feels that he has to compete with his father for his mother's affection. So the crisis is castration anxiety. Castration is um, the medical procedure that removes testes from males. And so the boy, Freud claims, is anxious about being castrated by his father if his father finds out about his attraction to his mother. <laughs> Crazy. But ultimately to resolve this crisis, the boy instead begins identifying with his dad and becoming more like his dad. And the subconscious thought here would be, if I can't have my mother, then I need to become like my dad who does have her, right? So then the electric complex in girls is similar, but there's a bit of an added component. So Freud says that girls develop a sexual attraction to their fathers, but mostly they're experiencing something that Freud called penis envy. So he claimed that girls um, are envious of the fact that they don't have a penis. And in some sense, it's as if girls have already been castrated because we don't have um, a penis or testes, right? And so this is the source of their anxiety. So again, to solve this crisis, the girl's gonna identify with their mother. And the subconscious thought is, if I can't have my own penis, then I need to become the woman who has access to a penis. And because their mother has access to their father's penis, that's, apparently <laughs> how that gets resolved um yeah all of this is i mean it kind of makes some sense in sort of a weird twisted crazy way but of course we've debunked most of this and then we have a stage um of latency and so during this stage there actually isn't an erogenous zone associated this is because the latent stage represents a pause in sexual interest and development and so the child is faced instead with reality anxiety. And the main crisis in this stage, because this is the time when they're entering school and many different social situations, is navigating those social waters, right? And so they're focused on these kinds of things more than sex at this age. And then we get to the genital stage and the pleasure center shifts back to the genitals again, just like it was in phallic stage. And so in this stage, we're really just um, maturing our sexual interests and we're seeking to form mutually satisfying bonds with others and develop our sexual interests appropriately. So then that brings us to fixations. And Freud said that if these crises aren't resolved properly in your life, then you would develop a fixation and your id pleasure seeking energy gets stuck in that stage and can't move forward. So the question at this point is, what does this really say about our personality? Well, Freud says, if there's no fixation, then good personality traits will develop. But when there is a fixation, we see both negative personality traits and negative behaviors or bad habits. So when it comes to the oral stage, if the child is weaned properly from breastfeeding, 
then they should exhibit positive personality traits like being independent and generous. But if they were improperly weaned, then they develop negative traits like being dependent, aggressive, and selfish. And they could also see a fixation in their behavior like um, becoming a smoker, having an eating disorder, being verbally abusive, biting your nails, anything like that that focuses on oral pleasure to reduce anxiety is um, a fixation. And then so in the anal stage, if parents encourage and reward and don't pressure their children during potty training, then the child should be competent, productive, and creative. Those are the good aspects of personality that will develop. Then there's two pathways for incorrect potty training. So the child can either become anal expulsive or anal retentive. So like I said, the main issue here is with external control. And so when parents or authoritative figures are telling a child when and where they can go to the bathroom, they might rebel against this. So if you have a child who's anal expulsive, they're gonna say, I'll show you, I'll go to the bathroom wherever I want. And so their traits are that they are messy, wasteful, and destructive. But if you have an anal retentive child, their response is, I'll show you, I won't go to the bathroom at all, <laughs> right? And this really does happen and persists for a few days um, sometimes, but I mean, it generally resolves itself. But in any case, some traits associated with anal retentive children are being orderly, rigid, or obsessive. Have you ever heard the term um, that someone is anal? Oh, she's, she's so anal, right? That means like um, controlling, right? Rigid, sort of things like that. That's where this comes from. And then within the phallic stage, this is the stage where Freud says that boys have castration anxiety and girls have penis envy. And he actually says that girls never have this fully resolved. And so all women remain somewhat fixated in the phallic stage. Now, a lot of people think this is a baseless claim that's pretty disrespectful of women, but it wasn't really as controversial of a claim during the time that Freud lived and was popular. But of course, today, most of Freud's theories have been debunked, and this one included. So personality traits associated with a fixation at this stage could be something like jealousy, possessiveness, things like that. In the latency stage, we see a cessation or a pause in sexual behavior and development. So during this stage is when children develop most of their social or interpersonal personality traits instead of um, ones related to sort of these sexual crises. <laughs> and then in the genital stage, we really just seek to form mutually satisfying bonds with others and develop our sexual interests appropriately. This is the stage where puberty hits. And so this stage sort of influences, um, you know, our intimacy and things like that. So moving on to all of Freud's defense mechanisms. The first is one we've talked about before, repression. So this is the idea of motivated forgetting. Something is so anxiety arousing or traumatic that I want to forget about it. I'm motivated to forget about it. I wanna push it to my unconscious mind and not have to deal with it, right? And Freud says that this underlies all of the other defense mechanisms. And really psychoanalytic and psychodynamic theory um, rest on sort of the assumption that we've repressed a lot of these things that happened in our childhood. The next is regression. So this is just going back to old behaviors from a previous psychosexual stage in order to reduce anxiety. So remember that these defense mechanisms and fixations too are used to decrease anxiety about things in our lives. That's their point, that's their goal, according to Freud. So pertaining to the psychosexual stages, we're trying to reduce anxiety about the relevant crisis at that time. But in general, we're always trying to decrease anxiety in our lives, and that's the goal, right? So an example of regression would be, um, you know, a school-aged boy who's been weaned from thumb sucking or using a pacifier begins using one or sucking his thumb when he feels anxious, like on the first day of school or when his mom goes out of town for work or something like that. That's an example of retreating to an oral stage Retreating to the anal stage could be experiencing something like constipation or the other way around uncontrollable bowel movements in response to anxiety. And that's pretty common, really, gastrointestinal issues in response to anxiety. The next is reaction formation. And so this is covering up some unacceptable emotion by presenting a different one, and usually it's opposite. So when you're mad, you know it's not appropriate to act out and be mad. And so instead you're gonna act really overly friendly to compensate for that negative feeling that you have. 
Projection has to do with taking your own characteristics or impulses, usually negative ones, and claiming that somebody else is that way or has those impulses, even if they don't. In interpersonal relationships, this is something that we talked about when I took psychopersonal relationships with Dr. Lawrence. Um, but within interpersonal relationships, we see this happen sometimes with cheating behavior. So once a partner cheats, they can actually become more suspicious of their partner and believe that their partner is cheating on them, for example. Rationalization. We all do this one. I dare you to go one day without making a rationalization of something, right? If you're late, you blame it on your alarm clock not ringing, your siblings hogging the bathroom, traffic on the way. Um, if you're passed over for a promotion, here's a different example, you might reduce that anxiety by telling yourself, I probably wouldn't have wanted that responsibility anyway, that would take up a lot of my time, would be really stressful for me and my family, or something like that. So rationalization is just a justification aimed to lower your anxiety or your disappointment. And then we've got displacement. So um, when it comes to displacement, you can't attack the source of your anger, your frustration. So maybe the thing making you angry is your parent, your boss, a teacher, right? You can't take out your anger on the person who's actually causing it. So instead you take it out on something else. That can either be a more appropriate target, like going to the gym and hitting a punching bag, or a less threatening target that cannot fight back, such as kicking the family dog. Sad, I know. Another example might be punching a wall, right? That's not exactly appropriate, but in fact, it is less threatening and cannot fight back, right? And then lastly is denial, which is just the total refusal to believe or even you know, perceive, notice um, some kind of painful reality, like a partner cheating, for example. Okay, so techniques that are used. In psychoanalytic theory, Freud always used free association. And so this is that idea that you come in and you lay down and Freud would just say um, words, right? And you're supposed to respond with the first thing that comes to your mind. So if he says train and you say dad, and he says pickle and you say dad, and he says animal and you say dad, <laughs> well, we're sensing a pattern here. Do you have some father issues? You have some daddy problems, right? So um, that's free association. It's just you're supposed to say whatever comes to your mind, no matter how trivial or embarrassing, and whatever you say should um, give Freud some kind of direction and um, understanding or insight into your unconscious mind. For psychodynamic theory, they use projective tests. And so I want to emphasize that this is about projection. So remember when we talked about projection as a defense mechanism, we talked about how you're putting your own characteristics or your own impulses onto another person? Well, with projective tests, you're supposed to project your inner thoughts and feelings. So you're putting your own unconscious thoughts and feelings onto the stimuli given to you in the test. And there's two that are most commonly used, the thematic apperception test is one where they just show you a photo of some kind of ambiguous scene and you're supposed to make up some kind of story or interpretation of what's happening in that scene. And the idea is that you're gonna be projecting some of your own unconscious thoughts and feelings into these stories that you're creating, whether you realize it or not, right? And then we've got the Rorschach inkblot test. You've probably seen this. This is the most widely used projective test. You get a set of 10 inkblots and you're supposed to um, interpret what is going on in the blots. So it's, it's kind of like the thematic apperception test, except um, they're just blots instead of actual images that have people and um, items that we're familiar seeing. So the ink blot test is more sort of ambiguous in the sense that it doesn't represent anything that you should have seen before. Um, but the idea is the same, that you're still projecting your inner thoughts and feelings by giving those interpretations of the blots. Okay, so we've got some challenges to Freud's ideas. Modern research contradicts most of his ideas. Specifically, um, today's developmental psychologists say we develop all throughout our lives. Development is lifelong. It's not something that stops after a certain point in childhood. And so going along with that, some people think that Freud overestimated how much parents influence a child compared to how much their friends influence them. Right? So since Freud's saying development is basically all centered in childhood, 
then your parents are gonna have like this huge impact, right? In fact, the crises that you're experiencing have everything to do with your parents. Weaning off of breastfeeding, that's something your mom has to do. Potty training, that's something your mom or dad has to do. Um, in the phallic stage, you're focused on a sexual attraction to the opposite sex parent. That has to do with your parents and the way they interact with you, right? So Freud overestimated how much parents make a difference and underestimated how much your friends make a difference in influencing the development of your personality. Next, researchers find very little support for the idea that defense mechanisms disguise sexual and aggressive impulses. We don't think that's true. And research says that repression, if it even occurs, is rarely a mental response to trauma. And in fact, it's way more common that traumatic events become flashbulb memories. Remember in chapter eight, we talked about how flashbulb memories are stored in your amygdala. And those are memories of particular, particularly memorable, um, emotionally arousing events, whether good or bad. But the most serious problem with Freud's theory is that it offers after the fact explanations, but fails to predict behaviors and traits. So for example, if you're angry at your mother's death, then Freud would say, oh, well, you just have unresolved dependency issues from the oral stage. But if you disagree with him, then his response is, but you're just repressing it. You don't realize this is the source of the issue, right? So doing things like this is exactly what made Freud so successful. So remember earlier when we were talking about the differences between psychodynamic and psychoanalytic theory, I said that psychoanalytic therapy is a long process. This is because Freud kept his clients coming back. How? Well, when his clients wanted to leave therapy, when they said, hey Freud, I don't think this is working for me, I don't wanna come back anymore, he would tell them that they were experiencing resistance. Keep that term in your mind because it's covered in chapter 16 on therapy, so we'll come back to it again later. But um, Freud said that when clients were close to making a breakthrough, they would resist treatment and attempt to leave it. So when the client would say they wanted to go, he would tell the client, no, the fact that you want to leave means you're about to make a breakthrough. You can't leave now, you have to stay. We're about to make major progress, right? So basically, Freud had an answer or an explanation for every outcome, which makes this sort of a catch-22. And this is why it's been so widely debunked, because it's just false assumptions that don't have any predictive validity. If you're a smoker, he'll say that you have a fixation from the oral stage. But if we um, do actually see issues in weaning a child off breastfeeding or something like that, that doesn't predict that they're going to become a smoker, right? So that's the problem is he gives explanations after the fact, after development has already occurred, but none of his theories actually predict our behavior and trait development. All right, moving on to humanistic theories. These are more realistic a little bit than the rest of these. Okay, so humanistic theories are theories that view per personality with a focus on the potential for healthy personal growth. And one thing we're gonna talk about is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, this was covered in chapter 11, only we cut out that section because we didn't have enough time to cover everything. So um, you don't need to memorize this pyramid. Usually we do ask people to memorize it, but this time around, um, you just kind of need to know the last two. So the hierarchy of needs is Maslow's pyramid of human needs. So he says, at the base, we have to have our most basic survival needs met first before we can move on to higher level needs like love and esteem and things like that. So we start out with um, satisfying the most basic human needs, our biological needs, and then we move up to sort of our cognitive, emotional needs. And really the ones that we wanna focus on here are self-actualization and self-transcendence. Those are really kind of the ones that um, affect our personality development the most. So self-actualization has to do with achieving your full potential and becoming the best that you can be. Um, you become the best actual self that you have the possibility to achieve. You self-actualize, right? But then self-transcendence is about moving beyond yourself and that's concerned with sort of the divine or spiritual contemplation and realization, stuff like that. But what you really need to know is that the underlying tenet of humanistic theory is that people are basically good and they want to self-actualize. They want to become the best they can be. They want to be the best version of themselves. So anytime I see humanistic, I think of the word humane. We're looking for the humanity 
in people, right? We're looking for um, this kind of goodness, this, this want to do better and to better oneself, right? That's the main fundamental truth, according to humanistic theorists, about the way that people are. And so Rogers came up with this therapeutic environment and he said, we need to have an environment that promotes growth in a person since that's the main goal. And so an environment that promotes growth has to have the following three things. Number one, the environment has to be accepting. The therapist you're talking to has to be accepting. They're gonna offer grace and understanding and something called unconditional positive regard, which is really just caring, accepting, non-judgmental attitude that Rogers said would help people develop self-awareness and self-acceptance. This just means that no matter what that client is saying to you, you are gonna respond positively in a caring and accepting and non-judgmental way, even if they've just told you that they're a serial killer, right? So this is difficult to do, but nonetheless, this, um, this is the environment that Rogers says we need to have to promote growth. So acceptance, genuineness is the next one, being authentic, transparent, and honest, and then empathy, sharing and mirroring the feelings of others. And this does go a step further than just acknowledging or understanding a person's feelings. This involves actually being affected by the emotions of others and taking on or sharing those feelings. And so within a growth promoting environment, a person should see a positive character, personality development, and they should develop a positive self-concept. So let's talk about that. Self-concept has to do with um, controversy between your ideal self and your actual self. And so Rogers says your ideal self is who you want to be. That's like the perfect version of yourself that you can create in your mind. It includes things like the goals or the status you want to accomplish and the desirable personality traits that you want to have. So your ideal self is who you want to be and your actual self is who you actually are. So if you have a positive self-concept, then your ideal and your actual selves will match up. This means that you are who you want to be, right? You are who you want to be. So we have a positive self-concept. We feel good about ourselves. But you develop a negative self-concept when your ideal and actual selves don't match up, which means that you are not reaching your goals of who you want to be. Okay, so critiques and evaluations of these. Humanistic theories have had a tremendous impact on the development of positive psychology. But critics say, Concepts of humanistic theories are vague and subjective, such as that idea of acceptance, genuineness, and empathy. You know, it's a little bit vague, that's kind of subjective. Maybe one person feels that they're being genuine, but it doesn't come off the same way as others, right? And how do we measure whether or not someone's living up to their full potential or experiencing personality growth, right? These are sort of the issues, vague and subjective. The next is that there's too much of an emphasis on individualism, and this is a real quote from Rogers. The only question which matters is, am I living in a way which is deeply satisfying to me and which truly expresses me? That feels like it should not be the only question, right? Because if that's the case, if you're only trying to live in a way that's deeply satisfying and that truly expresses you, then your id is gonna run rampant, right? This is gonna lead to self-indulgence, selfishness, moral weakness, impulsiveness, right? Things like that. And then lastly, the criticism is that humanistic theories are naive and they underestimate the human capacity for evil. So if that underlying tenet is that humans are basically good and they want to self-actualize, we are kind of painting a picture of humans that's too optimistic. This is naive, right? We're underestimating the fact that some people are just bad. They're just evil. They want to do evil things, right? Okay, moving on to trait theories. So a trait is a characteristic, there it is again, a characteristic pattern of behavior or a disposition to feel and act in certain ways. So simply put, a trait is a pattern of behavior that results from some kind of specific characteristic of a person, right? So there are 18,000 words in the dictionary, almost, that could be used to describe a person. So trait theorists are looking to condense all those possible ways of describing a person into a manageable number of basic traits. And that's what we use factor analysis for. So factor analysis is this statistical procedure that identifies clusters, which we call factors, of test items that all tap into or relate to some basic component of a trait. 
So let me give you a little more to work with on that. So with factor analysis, we're looking at all the items on a test and seeing which ones correlate with one another. So on some kind of standard personality inventory, you might have agree to disagree statements on a one to five scale, right? Where one is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree, something like that. And so what we're looking for is patterns in the data. If all the people taking the test have similar answers on more than one question, then those multiple questions can point to one underlying factor. So for example, if all the people who marked a five for outgoing also mark a five for talkative, and all the people marked who marked ones for outgoing also marked ones for talkative, this could point to the underlying factor of extroversion, right? Because being outgoing and talkative go together because they reflect the underlying trait of being either extroverted or introverted. Here's another example. Um, taste of food, food temperature, and freshness of food all relate to and describe the underlying factor of food quality, right? So on that worksheet, I've asked you to um, come up with your own example so you can just draw a little chart or um, use shapes or something like that on the Word document to create a chart similar to this, but make it your own example, not one that I've mentioned. And then next, we've got the big five personality factors. Notice that that's factors, so we must have used factor analysis to find them, right? The big five, you can use canoe or ocean to remember these. I've put it in the form of canoe. That's what I learned when I was in intro. Um, C stands for conscientiousness, A for agreeableness, N for neuroticism, O for openness, and E for extroversion. So let's talk about what each of these are and mean. Conscientiousness is the quality of wishing to do your work or duty well and thoroughly. Agreeableness is the quality of being enjoyable, pleasant, or willing to agree, right? Agreeable. Neuroticism refers to the quality of being prone to experiencing negative emotions, especially depression and anxiety. So another word for neuroticism is emotional stability or instability, right? The more neurotic you are, the more emotionally unstable you are. The less neurotic you are, the more emotionally stable you are. Openness is the quality of being accepting and receptive to change or new ideas. And extroversion is the quality of desiring social contact and preferring it to being alone. So there are some characteristics that go with each of these. For conscientiousness, um, that would be being organized, careful, disciplined, diligent, efficient. For agreeableness, those people are cooperative, kind, warm, friendly, polite. Neurotic people are moody, anxious, fearful, worrisome, and self-doubting. Openness is imaginative, creative, curious, willing to try new things. And extroverted people are outgoing, sociable, assertive, and impulsive. One thing that you might want to notice is that all of these um, sort of talk about a positive trait except for neuroticism. So you'd want to be more conscientious, agreeable, open, and extroverted perhaps, but nobody really wants to be more neurotic. And so we've actually had some debate about changing neuroticism to emotional stability so that it goes in the same direction with all of the other factors, but I just wanted to point that out so that you can notice that difference there. And so we've got some critiques and evaluations. The praise for the big five traits is that they can be objectively measured. They're relatively stable throughout the lifespan and they do apply to all studied cultures. So this is pretty consistent, reliable, valid, right? Criticism is that trait theories neglect to consider the impact of different situations on our behavior. Instead, they emphasize our disposition, our characteristic way of acting or being. And the other one is that it is possible for people to change with time or with age and trait theories really emphasize the endurance of personality characteristics and so they fail to recognize the capacity for change that people do have some people at least but this kind of gets fixed by social cognitive theories so over here in trait theories we are underestimating the situation overestimating the disposition Social cognitive theories kind of do the opposite. They maybe overestimate the situation and underestimate the disposition. So let's talk about that. Social cognitive perspective views behavior as influenced by the interaction between people's traits and their social context, right? So the power of the situation. 
Some interactions between personality and the social environment include these four. Now I just wanna note, you don't have to know these, you won't be tested on these four interactions. These come from my upper level textbook, but it is relevant to these theories and to the person situation controversy that's um, mentioned in your textbook. So I wanna talk about them anyway. So the first is perceptions, the way each individual sees or interprets their environment. So, you know, I mean, two people can be in the exact same environment and still perceive or experience it very differently. I think a political rally might be a good example here, right? One person might think the politician is doing a great job, but another person might perceive weaknesses in their performance or dislike their message, right? So even though the situation is the same, still our personalities are interacting with that situation and giving us different perceptions. The next is selections, and these are the social situations or environments that we choose to approach or interact with. So our personalities land us in certain social situations or environments. If you're extroverted, you'll attend the party next weekend and have experiences related to that, which an introverted person who chose not to go to the party would not experience. Next is evocations. So this is the reaction that we provoke from others, and this is mostly unintentional. Have you ever noticed that different people bring out different attitudes and responses from you? That's because their personality is interacting with yours and provoking or evoking those specific responses from you. So our personalities interact with the personalities of others, right? And the manipulations are the ways which we intentionally attempt to influence others. So this is sort of intentional evocation. <laughs> Ways that we convince others to alter their behaviors, even if the behavior is inconsistent with one of their personality traits. So for example, let's say you have a friend who's characteristically an honest person, and maybe you guilt them or blackmail them into helping you cheat on a test. Really what this emphasizes is the power of the situation on behavior, not just the power of your traits, right? So even though your friend might characteristically or usually be an honest person, that definitely doesn't mean that they're never going to lie. It just depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. Okay, so the idea of reciprocal determinism just says, hey, there are a lot of things that determine how you're going to behave in a given circumstance. Your past behavior, your internal cognition, and the environmental factors around you are gonna determine your behavior now, right? So. I just want to use an example, I think, to kind of clear this one up. So your behavior in your past relationships influences how you behave in your current relationship, right? Similarly, your internal cognition about the relationship that you have affects the way you behave in that relationship. And then environmental factors like social norms, proximity to the person you're dating, things like that are also going to influence your behavior in the relationship too. So what it comes down to is just that there are multiple things that determine our behavior, not just a trait or a situation or you know the way we're thinking about it. It's all of these things interacting. Okay, critiques and evaluations. Social cognitive theories have helped to shed light on the impact of situations on a person's behavior in various circumstances. And so this is the main thing that social cognitive theory focuses on when determining what behavior, behaviors we're gonna exhibit. The underlying tenet of social cognitive perspective is the power of the situation on our expressed behaviors. The power of the situation on our expressed behaviors. Critics say that social cognitive theories fail to appreciate a person's inner traits because they're overemphasizing the situational factors and underemphasizing individuality. Another critique is that unconscious motives, emotions, and pervasive traits matter too. And sometimes they may outshine the power of the situation because different people react to the same situation in very different ways. So there's gotta be some kind of interaction between our personality traits and um, the situation that we find ourselves in that affects our behavior, which of course is in fact true and that's what reciprocal determinism explains. So that's it. Be sure to fill out that worksheet and the evaluation on the last page for me please and go ahead and submit that to me and to Dr. Lawrence whenever you're finished. Um, other than that, Enjoy the rest of your week and thanks so much for listening.